Hi, this is Matt at Engine 7 Media. In last week's video, we met Bill Killen and heard about his history in the fire service. In this video, Bill is going to tell us about his time at NASA as a member of the astronaut rescue team. You know, the Kennedy Space Center Fire Department work schedule was 24 on and 48 off. And in that first 24 hours, uh, the first eight hours was straight time. And the second eight hours was either time and a half or a rest period. And we had a number of crews so that we had coverage around the clock. Well, when we were on early rest, which was basically from four to midnight, uh, we were pretty flexible. We could grab a portable radio and we could go out in the area and do area survey. And that area survey included going up to Happy Creek Road and uh, bass fishing in the creeks. Well, we just have to be up there, uh, our crew f on a little fishing excursion. And lo and behold, who is about 150 yards down the road from us, but Gus Grissom, who was fishing. And so uh, we went down and uh, chit-chatted with him. And uh, I did a little fishing there with the Gus Grissom. Well, a few weeks later, and I guess this was, this was up into December of 66, uh, and in January 67, I had the five to eight watch in the high altitude chamber when the astronauts were coming in to do their training and pre-flight training with the Apollo 1 command module. And as Gus come down the hall, he recognized me and invited me in as they suited up for the mission. Uh, that was unusual for, for me, but one of the things that uh, the, just about everybody in the fire department enjoyed was the ability and the flexibility to be face-to-face -face with these men and women who were making history in, in, in the space program. And uh, recently, as the last three years, although I left the space program in 74, I got to meet a young man who graduated from high school during the Skylab program that later became a space shuttle astronaut. And uh, Don Thomas and I became good friends and uh, have since visited his home. And also uh, he's come and spoke to a couple of uh, groups that uh, I was a member of and talked about his programs and his missions in space. NASA had a set of procedures and protocols in place for the Apollo 1 program that included the procedures and the structure for rescue of the astronauts in case they became incapacitated. And the fire in the Apollo 1 command module in January 1967 brought about a number of changes, not only in the design of the command module hatch and expanding the procedures and providing a larger rescue team for the Apollo program, and uh, I was one of nine candidates who were selected out of the 120 applicants for the position of astronaut rescueman. And we began our training in October of 1968. And the training consisted of a heavy schedule of uh, calisthenics, and jogging and running. And in the afternoon, we played tag football in uh, sugar sand, in the sand of uh, uh, Florida, it's a very sandy soil. And uh, in addition to familiarization with all the components of the Saturn V rocket and the Apollo command module, uh, we were very active in physical fitness and being physically capable of running up the stairs to the 320-foot level if we need be. But fortunately, we had a very fast high-rise elevator that took us to the 320-foot level, which is where we gained access to the white room for the command module. And our mission from NASA was to be able to extract the three incapacitated astronauts from the command module in less than a minute. And as the program grew over the years, by the time we got to Apollo 17, we were routinely extracting three astronauts from the command module in less than 30 seconds. Out of the nine people that were selected, uh, we had a group called the Prime Six. And the Prime Six were the six individuals who responded to the White Room with the task of extracting the astronauts from the command module. 
Uh, rescue two would be the individual that opened the blast protective hatch and opened the command module hatch. Rescue three carried in the resuscitators and rescue four went to set up a stretcher chair. Rescue five, which was my position, uh, observed uh, rescue six and rescue one who were on the, uh, uh, the gantry observing the operations inside and as the and ob observing rescue uh, three and four. As the first astronaut was extracted from the command module, uh, the process included removing the bubble helmet, placing a resuscitator on the astronaut, placing him in a stretcher chair, strapping him in, and then exiting the white room. As two and three, as rescue three and four exited the white room, I set up the chair, uh, we pulled this next astronaut out, and rescue five and six placed him in the chair and departed the white room. At that point, uh, rescue one came in and pulled the astronaut out, and he and rescue two, who was inside the command module operating, came out and placed the third astronaut in the rescue chair and exited the white room. And those uh, exercises took place in less than a minute. The exercises included removing the comm cables and the breathing air cables from each of the astronauts' suit and hooking a special tool into a hook that was manufactured within that astronaut suit to pull him out of the command module. Uh, we had a number of options once we left the white room, which were predicated upon the conditions and situation at hand. Uh, if it was not really a major obstacle or a serious situation with either the rocket or an explosive situation, we would take the high-rise elevator down to the A-level and then transfer to a low-rise elevator, take the astronauts out to armored personnel carriers and then rendezvous with uh, Air Force helicopters that were staffed with uh, paramedics and uh, flight surgeons. If it was uh, eminently de uh, a situation, we had a cable car, which we placed the astronauts in, and once the third astronaut and rescue team was on board, cable release would let the car slide down a cable to the bunker area 1,800 feet away, where the astronauts would be put in armored personnel carriers and again rendezvous with the uh, rescues. If it was really dangerous, we would take the elevator down to A level, then the Teflon slide tube into the rubber room, which was designed to withstand the explosion of a Saturn V rocket. So there were a number of options that we had uh, in where we would take the astronauts, depending upon the conditions at the time. Buzz Aldrin and uh, Neil Armstrong from Ohio, Wapakoneta, Ohio. Uh, Neil Armstrong was the first man to walk on the moon. And uh, it was very interesting as uh, part of the training of the astronaut rescue team was to train with the astronauts in some firefighting procedures using some extinguishers and things that were physically located on the launch uh, uh, tower. And uh, it was a great experience working with the astronauts. The real, the real story of the Apollo 13 was not so much the event that happened in space as to the work that went on behind the scenes and the uh, collaboration of the astronaut crews and the manufacturers of the various components, the command module, the lunar lander, and trying to configure the lunar lander to work as a lifeboat. And uh, thanks to duct tape and ingenuity, they were able to uh, make some adjustments so that the Apollo 13 command module could uh, make the transition around the moon and get back into trajectory into Earth orbit to land. And that's no joke. It was literally duct tape. I believe it was really, it was what, what did the astronauts have on board in the Apollo command module in the lunar lander that could be uh, configured to make the lifeboat work for their mission? On the Apollo 13 mission, one of the astronauts, uh, astronaut Mattingly, uh, was exposed to measles and they had to replace him with one of the backup crew members. 
And uh, there had been a previous event where astronauts had been exposed to uh, a sickness, and NASA created a primary contact program. They, they got to sit down at the table and says, all right, who has to have face-to-face uh, -face contact with the astronauts during the three-week period prior to launch? And they identified each of those organizations, and I was selected to be the primary contact for the Kennedy Space Center Fire Department. And what that meant was that for three weeks prior to launch, I was the only member of the fire department that could be in the presence of and face-to-face -face with the astronauts. It was a program designed to uh, prevent and limit exposure to infectious diseases. And uh, I was surprised how detailed it was. Uh, I had to provide uh, medical information and history, not only for myself, but for my family. And one day uh, at work, I was called into the office and the question was, what's wrong with your son? What do you mean, what's wrong with my son? Well, he's not in school today. And NASA had the program so detailed uh, that if one of my children was not in school, the school was to report that to NASA. And so come to find out that my son didn't go to school that day because he had a headache and a cold. But that program was, uh, was critical to ensure that the astronauts were healthy when they were uh, launched into space. The astronaut rescue team was based at the bunker, slide wire bunker, which is between 16 and 1800 feet from the launch pad. I don't remember the exact figure, but I know that it was about 15 to 1600 feet from the launch tower. And by the time we got to Apollo 17, which was a night launch, we were very relaxed. We had the hatch open on the armored personnel carrier and we're all lined up with our cameras taking pictures from the uh, armored personnel carrier. We got into countdown we, and the countdown started and all of a sudden it counted and went into a hold. And what was the problem? They got down to within 10, 12 seconds if I, as I recall. And uh, I can remember we closed that hatch pretty quick and we sat there and waited until NASA resumed the, the count and, and launched it into space. It was a beautiful sight. Uh, the launch of the Saturn V rocket lit the sky up. It was just as bright as it could be. But uh, there were a number of things uh, up leading up to each launch. We had training sessions with the various flight crews of the uh, different Apollo missions. And uh, one of the things the astronauts enjoyed was the uh, armored personnel carriers that we used. Uh, in fact, uh, Colonel Joe Engel even drove one of the armored personnel carriers in the uh, training area where we trained. The Nomex gear with all of the mission patches on it is the Nomex gear that I wore as a member of the astronaut rescue team. And the hard hat, the red hard hat, was uh, the hat that I wore when I was assigned for escort duty to escort the astronauts from the suit room at the Manned Spacecraft Operations Building down to the transfer van that took them to the launch pad. And <clears throat> framed in the frame back there is uh, the American flag off of Neil Armstrong's training suit. And in that same frame, I believe, is a gold foil, which was uh, the material that the lunar lander was wrapped in. My wife's uncle worked for Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, and uh, he gave me that piece of gold foil, uh, which was material used to wrap the lunar landers, I stated. Also in that frame is the challenge coin that uh, had created to commemorate the uh, 50th anniversary of the astronaut rescue team. And uh, there are other items back there. One is a uh, cue card, which is uh, used by the astronauts for operating the lunar lander. Uh, a vehicle pass signed by Kurt Debus, who was the director of the Kennedy Space Center, and also signed by the wife of Charlie Duke, uh, astronaut in Apollo 16 mission. And uh, there's a picture of my dad with Colonel Jim McDivitt and my youngest brother that was taken at Langley Air Force Base. My dad was stationed at Langley Air Force Base, and that's where NASA maintained the lunar lander trainer that the astronauts trained for the landing on the moon. But the one that I'm really proud of is a uh, sketch. NASA had a number of uh, sketch artists in, to commemorate and document the Apollo program. And during the countdown demonstration test for the Apollo 8 mission, 
uh, NASA had several sketch artists there, and like a lot of guys, people would say, well, where are you fellas from? And this one uh, fella said, I'm from Akakik, Maryland. And I turned and said, who's from Akakik? He said, I am. And uh, I said, well, I'm from Indian Head, which was five miles down the road. And he continued to sketch. When he finished, he tore it off the sketch pad and he handed it to me. And for years, I had it in a folder. But it's a sketch pad that was a sketch of the astronaut rescue team as we were suiting up for a countdown demonstration test. So like a lot of souvenirs, uh, that's one I'm very proud of from the Kennedy Space Center. That was Brian Lawless, who was a very well-known sketch artist. Remember to like, subscribe, and click the bell icon to get notifications when new videos are posted. Also, share the videos with your friends and coworkers and leave a comment. Your input counts, and we'd love to hear from you. If you have a story to share with us, let us know. Thanks for watching, and have a great day.